Hello and welcome to another episode of Room 420. I am with my guest today, Jeffrey Zucker. He is a podcast host of People Are the Answer. You're an entrepreneur. You're involved in a lot of stuff like the Medical Cannabis Board, correct? Yeah, I'm on the board at Marijuana Policy Project. Cool. I hope I was like, I hope I don't butcher this. I'm doing my best here. I'm always like lines. Um, so what, what do you do with that with that policy board? Yeah, so uh, I've been on the board at MPP for about five years or so, and MPP is the largest organization dedicated solely to making cannabis legal. It's been around since 1995, uh, and I've been involved in most of the state changes over the years. And myself, you know, being on the board, I help with overall top-level strategy, help with fundraising, and originally I'm from Charleston, South Carolina, and so I've spent a lot of time working on trying to legalize medical cannabis in South Carolina. Uh, what are kind of some problems you run into with like Cal South Carolina and like the South in general? In general, um, there's certainly still stigma surrounding cannabis, um, especially in places like the Southeast. Um, I would say there's also kind of a, a vibe amongst the legislators that this is more taboo than it really is. They don't realize, despite polling, that constituents generally are for it. Um, it there's just a lot of misconceptions still. And you know, when I go down there, I get all the jokes. You know, you go up to the legislature, people are like, did you bring samples? Like, <laughs> ah, I've never heard that one. Um, you know, so it's just, it's a lot of just kind of trying to get over these things that are built into people's heads. I mean, myself growing up in the Southeast, cannabis was demonized, and um, it was just something I never really thought to touch. And then, um, you know, in my early 20s, kind of had my eyes open to it, and I started researching it once I realized, like, this isn't the demon it was painted to be. Yeah, yeah. So what, what was like your first experience with that when you were like, oh, wow. I mean, the first time I tried cannabis, I think I was probably like 23. Mm -hmm. And I was nervous. Um, someone talked me into it. And I really enjoyed it. It was relaxing. I tend to be an anxious person. And it was helpful in that regard. And so just my immediate reaction was like, why is the narrative what it is? Mm -hmm. You know, why was I taught that this is wrong? And that led me to seeing, uh, researching and learning about the war on drugs and the atrocities that have come with it and the disparity in enforcement among races um, and a lot of the just different things that were pushing against cannabis for the wrong reasons. And we were bred to believe that was right in, in so many ways. Mm -hmm. So like... Growing up in that kind of culture, like, what, what do you think was some of, like, the biggest, I guess, myths that you kind of heard? I mean, just a lot of the stuff that they put in Reefer Madness, you know, scrambling your brain <laughs> and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if it was cannabis-specific, but I remember a teacher telling us as kids that, you know, if you take drugs, you could be insane for the rest of your life immediately. And it's so just <laughs> a lot of scare tactics, you know, and yeah. I think you were taught to believe people are bad if they're on drugs or if they're addicts. But the truth of the matter is that addiction is a serious problem and disease and that a lot of the people that are stuck in these things, it, it, it's because of their circumstances. They're, they're victims of circumstances. They're victims of this mess of a system that we live in. Um, and it's not as simple as good and bad. Yeah. So what are some, uh, I guess, like examples of ways you've kind of, came in and be like hey this is this is a good way to change this law or or like hey this isn't working even if it is legalized are there any like things you've seen where like hey this works and this doesn't we've certainly gotten a lot of experience over the years um you know I th we're in near 40 states with some sort of medical cannabis law um i believe we're at 16 full adult use states and uh some states have certainly been better off than others colorado's done a pretty good job you know, in terms of what doesn't work, I'd say you look at California and uh, their ridiculous taxation, all that has done is really pumped up the illicit market and allowed it to, to thrive um, because they made the product inaccessible to the people that need it. And I, people generally would love to have regulated uh, products so that they can be tested and go through that process. But if you're making it unaffordable, they're going to do what they need to do. Yeah. Do, you th do you think there's a way... I mean, if it's legalized, maybe like insurance will kind of help cover that with the medical side or. Yeah, I, I do think there's a world where insurance covers it. I, I believe Italy is one of the countries where insurance uh, can cover your medical cannabis. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything on the state level happening 
already in that regard. There may be, um, but I envision a future for sure where medical cannabis comes under some sort of insurance coverage, probably after we have more changes at the federal level. Okay. So like, what is, what is Italy's like kind of a program like, do you know? Or? Honestly, I'm not an expert. Yeah. Um, I just, having done the research that I do keeping up with the news, I recall a while back Italy uh, beginning to allow people to uh, claim medical cannabis for their, under their insurance. Mm. Um, I think there's a couple other countries in Europe that are allowing it. Um, but it just in general, the mindset around certain countries in Europe and in Israel is just, you know, this is medicine as, as much or more as a lot of other things on the market, and uh, we're here to support that. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's kind of interesting, too, is we were, we were talking about just here in the States about, um, like, Nevada with, like, their kind of arrest loopholes where it's still on the Nevada board as a Schedule One controlled substance, and they're still arresting people for that, too. And it's kind of interesting that we're still in this gray area and stuff like that. Like, how do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's incredibly frustrating. I mean, you know, right now there are people making money on this industry, yet there's still people in jail for this plant, and it's really awful, honestly. Like, we've the industry that I got into seven or eight years ago was one that was more rooted in social justice, I felt, but as more and more capital has come into the space, as more and more corporations have come in, we've started to see it move towards a focus on profits versus you know, actually creating a just system. Um, and I, I think that that's something that we, we need to be aware of. Um, I kind of lost my train of thought on what oh, you yeah. asked, but... Well, I, 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 it was kind of a bad question, I'll admit that. I think like, I'm curious, like, how do we find like, social equity? stuff you know yeah so yeah you were talking about like federal versus state yeah. i mean it's, it's a huge pain um and fortunately we've been able to get patients access and otherwise people access to cannabis via the state legislature there's a lot of work going on at the federal level it's just federal change is slow unfortunately um we reconcile with it by trying things out and you know oftentimes things go to court regarding cannabis and Sometimes they end up in a federal court and they throw them out or uh, we really we, we need that change to really get to like a level playing field overall. Um, but in general, some states can learn from others in terms of their social equity initiatives. You know, places like Illinois and Massachusetts have done a decent job of incorporating social equity into their laws and they're trying to do better as they go as well in those two states in particular. Um, but in general, no one's done great at it yet. So we're still learning. Um, and hopefully, long term, this will be an industry where the people who are harmed by the war on drugs will have an opportunity to profit and to benefit from it. I almost feel like, I mean, just on the surface for me, it's like, hey, why don't we let these people out who are arrested for, you know, drug offenses and like get them into the industry? It's like schooling, all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, I'm just kind of curious if there's like a, an initiative for that or do you see, do you see anybody kind of pushing that? There certainly are a variety of organizations that, that try to push things in that direction. You know, Last Prisoner Project has been really great in terms of reentry and helping people get into the industry. Um, I'm sure there are ones that I wish I was naming right now that aren't coming to mind, but certainly as a concept, the idea of reentry into the industry uh, is an important one. And I think certain states have ridiculous laws that don't allow for people that have these past convictions to be to work in it and it's it defeats the purpose honestly it's it's, it's frustrating um, but I think that we're starting to move in the right direction I, I think that any cannabis entrepreneur especially um, you know those that, that weren't affected by the war on drugs it's really important that they keep in mind how crucial it is to try to give back to those communities that did have to deal with all of these issues I mean it's it's unbelievable when you look at how one offense has ruined so many lives, even these, these minor nonviolent drug offenses that, you know, a joint could put yeah. someone in jail for 20 years in some States. And it's uh, oftentimes, you know, worse, uh, the darker your skin color is. And it's, it's a real shame. And, um, we need to start working harder to get those people out of prison. Uh, president Biden did recently grant clemency to, uh, some, some people with drug convictions and that's, that's a good start, but we have a ton more work to do. Yeah. I think, uh, I'm, I'm also curious too, just based on like, you know, we always talk like, what can the government do? Like, what can we do just, you know, everyday average Joe with helping people like that too? 
Yeah, in terms of, of what you can do, I would say, you know, check out MPP's website, mpp.org. Um, other awesome organizations like Students for Sensible Drug Policy, ssdp.org, um, and, you know, Last Prisoner Project. I could go on and on naming the organizations, Drug Policy Alliance, but really just see who's out there, see who aligns with what you believe, and if you're able to, donate. If there's out, You can find on these websites often opportunities to volunteer, uh, opportunities to help with um, legislative initiatives. For instance, in South Carolina, if somebody listening here is uh, a South Carolina native uh, or someone that lives there, uh, they need to call their representative. They're debating medical cannabis on the House floor this week, and um, people don't realize you can truly make a difference especially on the local level, hearing from one constituent, I have seen it with my own eyes, can affect the decision of a legislator. Mm. Interesting. Has there, has there been, like, uh, I guess, like, something you've seen, like, an example you, you're able to put out? Or? I mean, really, yeah. like, I, the, what I've seen a lot of is in South Carolina, um, you know, we have legislators that are on board with medical cannabis. We have ones that are in the middle. We have ones that are staunchly op- uh, opposed. And I recall a summer, maybe four or five years ago, meeting with a certain senator, and he was just thought it was ridiculous that, you know, we're trying to legalize a drug and that, you know, if anyone should do it, it's the FDA. And we try to explain, well, that's going to leave a lot of people suffering for a long time. Um, And the next year I met with him again and expecting to hear something similar, but he was doing me the nice, you know, nicety of, of meeting. And I came in and he's like, you know, I actually completely changed my mind. Uh, someone in his family, I think maybe his sister-in-law or something, had uh, come across medical cannabis um, as a means to alleviate cancer symptoms um, and uh, chemo symptoms. And he was like, I get it now. Um, and he understood why it couldn't. You know, a lot of the legislators will ask, like, why can't this go to the FDA? Why can't you give me exact dosage? And one, there's just there's not enough research. There's a lot of great people doing research on cannabis, but there's not enough yet. And two, everyone's body chemistry reacts differently to it. We all have these endocannabinoid systems um, that serve as receptors for the chemical compounds within the plant, and we all react differently. And so, you know, when I'm in South Carolina talking to a legislator that doesn't know anything about cannabis, and they're like, why, why can't it be a, just one pill or something? And it's like, well, if someone is has is the type of person or, or has an issue that causes spasms, for instance, uh, an inhalation, whether it be vapor or smoke, might immediately alleviate their symptoms. Whereas somebody that's going through chemo, the, mo- the easiest way for them might be uh, via edibles, which take longer to onset. So um, there's so many nuances to this that don't make it as simple as why can't the FDA just do it? Yeah. It almost feels like it, it's always somebody else's like solution. Like you do it, you yeah. figure it out and stuff like that. And you're like, well, Maybe we could just, like, give people the choice, you know what I mean? I think it's, like, such a simple solution, but almost isn't, because we, we still demonize it so much. Yeah, it, it's mind-boggling. You know, there's a lot of people that do claim to stand for freedom, and um, a lot of people that espouse libertarian values that don't necessarily agree. I mean, generally, libertarians are on board with cannabis for freedom of choice, like you mm-hmm. said, Um a lot of it's political. I mean, there's so many egos involved in politics. I never wanted to be in politics. I think it's just, like, frustrating and, like, puts people in a bad mood. But cannabis legalization was something that I felt strongly enough about to get engaged with it. And it, it's led me to a front row seat to how our system works. And it's it's basically you get where you are by knowing people and schmoozing, and then you schmooze more to try to change minds. And that's how laws get changed, and I hate it. You know, there's not enough people being represented. Like, the regular people don't get represented very well. So I'll I'll mention one other really cool organization. Um, Of course, I'm going to, I'm just like blanking. Oh, CrowdLobby, crowdlobby.com. So they've started a website where people can basically pull money together in sort of a Kickstarter format in order to fund lobbying for certain initiatives. So you know, when you look at cannabis, for instance, or, or other uh, plant-based medicines and psychedelics, there's a lot of opportunity to substitute them for certain pharmaceuticals. And the pharmaceutical companies obviously have really big uh, dollar amounts that can go toward lobbying. And in our general reality, there's no one really representing 
the little guy. And so, you know, they, they are incentivized based on their business model to push for these things to go away that solve problems because they'd rather you buy their prescription every month. Yeah. Um, and so I think that it's important to recognize in our political system that they're really, even though these are elected officials, unfortunately the way it works is that they, they're just listening to either who gives them money or who's in their circles um, once you get them there. And so many of them are politicians for life versus someone just taking a step out of society to be a politician, I think, like it was originally intended. And that results in difficulty in getting things done that are really representative of the people. So I applaud innovative solutions like Crowd Lobby that try to fight against that. That's really cool. I feel like that tech is kind of disrupting that kind of that place. And like you said, you're like, I didn't want to get into this, but you've kind of found it like a necessity in some way. So how did you get into get into politics? I mean, really, it started most, I mean, I had been reading about all of the politics around this and then, you know, eventually got asked to join the board at MPP. And that was really my first actual deep dive into the political world. Um, we legalized cannabis and generally in two methods at MPP, one via ballot initiative and two via legislature, which is generally harder. A state like South Carolina, you're not a uh, ballot initiative isn't an option. So literally the only way we can pass this is to get it through these legislators and they tend to be regardless of which side of the aisle they on so they're on some of the more conservative people um and so it's a lot harder than just about initiative to do that and so for me it was like I, I was working at mpp just on the board and i said you know how can i make this happen in south carolina and um i i donated and i i got some others to donate to the cause in the area and that allowed us to uh, hire a lobbying, lobbying firm there to, to put some of the organization's resources towards there. And um, I got my first front row seat to the political process. I've done some work in some other states and federally as well since. And it's it's not glamorous. <laughs> yeah. What, what do you think has been the most interesting state as far as like the, the system and how it works? I don't know about most interesting, but like Oklahoma is just one that comes to mind just because there it's been kind of a free for all in terms of licensure. And I think that's probably how uh, most like libertarian types would want it to be. Just let the market figure itself out. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably going to lead to a lot of people losing their businesses and uh, you know, bigger guys coming in and gobbling up the successful ones. So some people will do well, but a lot of little ones falling off and that's generally how market dynamics work. So I, I think it's, it's one to watch. Um, it's an interesting one to watch and to see they're probably going to have um, full adult use on their ballot coming up. So uh, it'll be interesting to see kind of five, ten years down the road what that market looks like based on where it started now. And I think that also speaks to the cannabis industry as a whole. Um, I heard, uh, I was listening to, I think it was a TED Talk recently where someone said that, um, that you know, if you look back at the car industry, there were hundreds of American car companies, and now there's really like five. Yeah. And it's like, I, unfortunately, that seems to be the direction that cannabis is going as well. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you see like um, them finding a balance, I guess, with like social equity and like helping people out versus like this market? You know what I mean? Like, how do we balance that? I'd like to see it. Yeah. I mean, it's tough because you can only legislate so much versus like letting the market do its thing. Yeah. Um, so my hope is that somebody finds the, the key to the, to the right kind of legislation to make the market more equitable. Um, but I just, unfortunately, our world and society are driven by money and money speaks. And so it's, I think it's imperative that we try to realign our incentives as much as possible, both in and outside of business. But in the meantime, it's probably a pipe dream that it goes the right way fully. I think it's interesting because I remember like when Colorado first legalized too, like we had laws like, you know, you could have six plants at home that you can grow in. And I, I remember thinking that was interesting. It's like, well, if you just put the work in, I don't have to go to the store. I could just grow my own. Yeah. And even like the medical card, I don't, they don't do this anymore. But like if you're doing edibles, like growing 99 plants for yourself. Right. You know, so you're like, sure, why not? Why wouldn't I do that if you knew how? Right. You know, and I, I think it's interesting. Like how do we give the education for that too. And then some of these laws, like if people do want to run that option too, you know? Yeah. I mean, uh, home growth specifically is interesting. There's certain States that don't allow for it. And that's seen as 
you know, myself as an advocate for legalization, I want home grow to be available and everything to be available. And then there's people whose incentives are pushing them to try to keep people away from home growing because they want their money. Yeah. Uh, that That's happening in some states and it's frustrating. In general, I think it'd be ideal for everyone to learn. Of course, not everyone's going to want to do it. Yeah. But I think giving everybody the access, the accessibility, um, the the knowledge would be tremendously helpful. Um, we So my company, Greenland Partners, we co-host with Boston University, a startup competition every year. Um, we've done five so far, five years in a row. Um, and it's for ancillary cannabis companies. And our most recent winner is uh, a company called Boundless Robotics that makes a really cool um, product called Anaboto. And this device basically, we s I've seen other things like it in the industry over the years in terms of home grow, but basically, but it's a much prettier version that really fits in your home. It's basically a, plug and play system for growing oh. and you know just kind of put in your water and like uh, a cartridge and your plants and you watch it grow but there were a lot of things that seemed to fail that kind of looked like a big refrigerator that had a little bit more difficulty with them uh anaboto is really simple and it just it kind of looks like a beautiful lamp in your living room wow um and i think that you know while as Carl is the founder. He's amazing. And I think as he continues to figure out efficiencies, you know, his pri the prices will be able to come down over the years and this things like that will be accessible. Um, so I think we're getting to a point where that's possible. But again, you know, from a lobbying and legislative side, we yeah. have to make sure that the big businesses are just aligned with getting everyone access versus like making sure they come by at my dispensary. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I feel like if we get Chia Pet on our side too, maybe it'll help. It'll, you know? That'd be pretty cool. You do a cannabis Chia Pet. Yeah, just growing it. It's like, oh, what's that? It's Bob Ross. That's what yeah. it is. You've never, you've never loved your Chia Pet so much. No. <laughs> like super, super, super TLC. That that's freaking awesome though. As far as like how people are innovating cannabis, like, um, it's like our company, we do an innovation in cannabis scholarship to students and like some of the ideas we'll get, like people are like, oh, here's a home like dispenser or something like it'll just put THC in whatever drink you have. I was like, that's incredible. I hope that takes off. That'd be awesome. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think I've found so many innovators over the years and there's so many cool things, so many possibilities. You and I can see a really cool future for I would say the biggest hurdle to innovation in the space that I've seen now is that a lot of the companies that are actually make, making money are the multi-state operators, the groups that have lots of licenses, and they're not currently all that incentivized to innovate. So, you know, I have friends that say create products like software or hardware that create efficiencies and grows. And like, you know, they might take it to one of the biggest uh, multi-state operators. Their answer has generally been like, I don't have time to worry about efficiency right now. I'm just growing and growing and mm -hmm. growing and building my business. And so it's like, oh, well, even though this could save you 25%, it's like, I don't have time to implement that. This is working as it is. Yeah. So unfortunately, that's slowing growth. And so there's people with these amazing ideas that I've seen a lot of over my time, and they, they fall off. And unfortunately, you know, good ideas at the wrong time don't always make it. Yeah. I, I think... Uh just working on the growing and we had some people in the office too who are growers and I think some of the stuff not just like how it's like just grow 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 but it's like you start to see like mildew and like you know mites and kind of the stuff that the consumer doesn't see where I'm like hey we got to figure this out before there is like a, a little bubble burst right stuff too I mean fortunately most of the states have pretty good testing in terms of the legal product um so I mean I've seen recalls and stuff happen in Colorado but hopefully they catch it beforehand mm -hmm. Um, and in terms of when I said grow, grow, grow with like the big MSOs yeah. and stuff, it's like grow their business. Like, yeah, they're yeah, just yeah. growing. Let's grow cannabis like we always have just because it's working and we're growing a business right now. Um, but once we get to that point where I was talking earlier, where it's like hundreds of car companies go down to five and we go from hundreds of cannabis companies to a smaller number um, in terms of those that are actually growing the product, I think that's when we'll start to see those efficiencies taken more interest in. Mm. I think that's interesting too to think about because I'm like, I'm hearing grow and I'm like immediately like, yeah, we're growing the plant. You know, it's like, well, use weather in a sentence. Well, I don't know whether the weather will be bad. <laughs> you know, it's, um, I think it's so, so interesting, like in this industry that there's, there is like, you know, using that term again, like so much growth in so many different sectors. Um, I think like our company was 2017, you know, and it's kind of widely grown and, you know, kind of hyping up my own business right now. But um, I think it's pretty interesting just seeing how everything 
is growing. And with those growth, like you're talking, there's, there's new problems, yeah. you know, and I, I would hate it if like, you know, Pepsi is selling us like a cannabis drink and there's still people in jail for, you know, like that would be awful. Right. You know, so like how, I'm like, how do we fix that, that problem? I think that's the biggest for me. Yeah. Um, get engaged locally. Like I said, everyone locally can make a difference. Um, you know, go to the, the various uh, organization sites to find out both legislative initiatives that are going on, ballot initiatives. Um, there's also opportunities to get engaged with things like uh, reentry programs for people that are coming out. And um, if you're a cannabis company, like trying to work with reentry programs for hiring is incredible. And if you're not, you know, those are opportunities to volunteer. Um, and just really looking at it as a whole is not only cannabis legalization, not only drug legalization, but reforming our criminal justice system. Unfortunately, our criminal justice system is so tied to drug legalization. Um, and it's why we have so many more people incarcerated than anywhere else. Uh, so it's important, to, I think, to have sort of that zoomed out view of like, how can I help make the criminal justice system a little better or make somebody that's going through it or coming out of it have a little bit more of a chance to succeed and reintegrate into, ses into society. Mm. I think that that's awesome. What do you, what do you think, or I guess, like, because I know you do your own podcast. You've talked to a lot of people probably about that subject and stuff. Has there been any ideas where you're like, holy crap, that's a light bulb? I wish there was something like lightning like that was like this will solve a lot right here but I would say the most powerful thing I've seen is just is storytelling so um, you know I do some work in the film industry and I've gotten engaged with groups that are just really trying to include messages within their film and not hitting people over the head with a message but say an awesome movie like Just Mercy um, about Brian Stevenson and the Equal Justice Initiative. You know, Jamie Foxx and Michael B. Jordan are in that movie, so people are going to watch it. But, and it's a great movie about great characters, but people don't realize, hey, you're also learning about the mess of our criminal justice system and the people stuck in it as you're watching it. And so I think telling stories is a really powerful way to change minds. Um, I had on my podcast relatively recently an incredible woman, Alice Marie Johnson, um, after over 20 years in jail, she got clemency um, t due to the help of Kim Kardashian, who got it to, to President Trump when the ACLU made a video about Alice. And now she has an organization called Taking Action for Good, and she's telling the story of people that are stuck in jail or people that are just coming out of the system. Um, and that's like making actual change. I mean, that's how her life changed was Kim Kardashian saw this video about her. Um, so she sees the power and the humanity of that. Um, I think that's the number one thing. Just in our society in general, there's so much division. And this has come up a lot on my podcast. Is just like remembering that we're all human. Uh, we're on team humanity, as I like to put it. <laughs> you know, uh, I was having a chat with somebody yesterday. Like things like food, music, cannabis, they really bring people together and just kind of like show the humanity. And I think the types of stories that Taking Action for Good is telling uh, do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So I would say that storytelling in various capacities is probably the most powerful way to move forward. And in terms of individuals helping, it's watching those stories, supporting the people involved, finding out whose stories aren't being told and seeing what you can find out and how you can push their story forward. I, I think that's interesting. Like you were talking about that Senator too, with like his kind of emotional response to his family member and how it changed his view. And then and that, um, and I totally hundred percent agree with you. I think storytelling is like what saves us. Um, and on like a flippant side of it, it's like comedy. A lot of times we'll just show the dark side of it. Cause I always think I learned so much from Harold and Kumar escape from Guantanamo Bay, you know, where it's like, Oh, okay. That's interesting. A different look on it. Or even South park. I think yep. sometimes just hits the nail on the head. Absolutely. Stuff. It's teaching people in a format that they didn't expect to learn from that. They didn't, maybe don't even realize they're learning from. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think when done responsibly, especially it can be really effective. Interesting. So I, I do have a question for you. Is there one story where you're like, man, Hollywood needs to check this out. They need to tell that story. I mean, I think it would be awesome for Alice Marie Johnson's story to be turned into a movie. I mean, I imagine there's people working on it. I haven't spoken to her about that specifically, but mm -hmm. I've got to think that that is the case right now. And I think, um, you know, I, this is just me thinking off the cuff right now, but somebody like Betty Aldworth, who 
She's now the head of communications for MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. She was previously the executive director of Students for Sensible Drug Policy, and she also led outreach for um, uh, Amendment 64 here um, that legalized cannabis. Okay. Um, and she's an example of a really amazing, powerful female leader that has truly changed the world that people don't hear a lot about. Mm. I think it'd be awesome. I think what you're saying, too, just came into my mind, like... Um, that Temple Grandin story, I remember a while back, and I was like, that just blew my mind. Yeah. That this woman just accomplished so much with autism and innovated the the agricultural industry and like all these stories that like I have no idea. So I appreciate you bringing that up, dude. And that's awesome. Yeah, that's really awesome. Absolutely. There's there's so many good stories out there. There's obviously a lot of content to dig out, you know, dig through these days to get the right ones. But um, I think. If we can combine tremendous filmmakers that are passionate about these causes, um, along with the people that actually know the right answers to the questions, it could be really powerful. That's awesome. That's a, that's a good note, I think, to end on. That's really awesome. So, hey, uh, I want to thank you so much for coming on this podcast, Jeffrey. So, Jeffrey Zucker, so you want to plug your podcast real quick so people can get yeah. some more info? Sure, yeah. Check out peoplearetheanswer.com. Um, we're on all the major podcast platforms on YouTube. Um, I interview innovators in social impact, you know, from talking about everything, a lot of drug policy and criminal justice reform, of course, um, but also educators and I mean, from my perspective, I hadn't, haven't had them yet, but I consider comedians innovators and in impact oftentimes. So um, anybody that is making the world a better place um, in a unique way is a candidate to be interviewed. And, you know, we've got 25 or so out so far. So um, some great people for, for guys to check out. I was, I was listening to it a little bit. I was like, I'm going to do my research on this. I was like, good, good stuff, man. So really insightful today. I mean, I've been seeing my boy Noel nodding his head all, to, all time today. Uh, so anytime that happens, I'm like, all right, we're good. So, hey, if you guys are watching at home, be sure to follow us at Very Hill to stay up to date on the latest in cannabis news. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.